If you are listening to this podcast on Monday, January 27th, then join me in celebrating Charles Lutwidge Dodson's birthday, who was born 188 years ago today. For those who don't know who Charles Lutwidge Dodson is, you would probably know him by his pen name, which is Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll was the author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass along with some other books that he wrote, actually many other books that he wrote. What some people don't know is that Lewis Carroll was also a mathematician. As a matter of fact, there are many literary authors who have hailed from scientific and mathematical backgrounds. Many of these great authors include Bertrand Russell, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature, Julia Goldman, Sophia Kovaleskaya, Petronella Johanna de Timmerman, Neil Stevenson, Laura Bassi, whom I've talked about before, Annie Francais Harar, Mary Kingsley, Omar Khayyam, Arthur C. Clarke, E.T. Bell, who is also known as John Tain, Dan Barbillion, who is also known as Ion Barbu, Rudy Rucker, Pierre de Fermat, and one of my personal favorites, Isaac Asimov. The list goes on and on. Each of these authors wrote and are still writing exceptional works. If you haven't checked out Jay Golden Lane, she's amazing. She writes some great fiction. What I love most about reading works by these authors is that many of them interweave their math and science backgrounds into their works. Whether their influence is subtle or overt, it is mentally exhilarating when science and math merges with potent literature that moves our heart and stirs our minds. Instead of just reading for entertainment, we find ourselves in the thick of science and math, wrapping our thoughts around concepts that go beyond emotion. Instead, we are drawn to pull out our calculators, graph diagrams, and do deeper research into scientific theories. That level of reading is more than active reading. It's exhilarating. What is most wonderful about Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventure in Wonderland is the way that he introduces logic to his readers without them even knowing. This logic is essential to mathematics and philosophy, as it helps us to reason propositions and statements and prove if a statement is correct or incorrect. If we can find falsehoods in statements using well-researched, well-thought-out reason and proofs, then... Logic has effectively done its job. Adventures in Wonderland contains so many examples of good logic and deliberately bad logic. My favorite is the conversation at the Mad Hatter's tea party. The conversation goes like this. Then you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. I do, Alice hastily replied. At least, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing, said the Hatter. Why, you might just as well say that I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. And then the March Hare added, You might just as well say that I like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. You might just as well say, added the Dormouse, who seemed to be talking in his sleep, that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. It is the same thing with you, said the Hatter, and here the conversation dropped, and the party sat still for a minute. So, in this conversation, Carol presents pairs of related statements between the Hare, the Hatter, and the Dormouse. Each pair of statements do not say the same thing. The Hatter proposes the statement, I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. This isn't entirely true, because as humans, we see our computers, our cars, etc., but we don't eat them. The March Hare proposes that I like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. This isn't entirely true as well, especially for my listeners who received a really awful gift and immediately regifted it. And I am so guilty of that one too. Then the Dormouse says, I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. When we turn to the Dormouse's arguments into an if-then statement, we get, if I sleep, then I breathe, and if I breathe, then I sleep. This isn't entirely true as well unless you struggle with narcolepsy. So, where does the math come in? Well, the hypothesis in the first statement interchanges sleep and breathe in the second statement. As a result, the second statement is a converse of the first. In math, this is called a conditional statement. 
The converse of a conditional statement is created when you interchange the hypothesis and the conclusion. And so the converse of a true statement can also be false, which means that a statement and its converse don't have the same meaning. Now, Let's talk about contrapositive statements using the Dormouse's argument. The contrapositive is a little bit like the converse, only instead of just interchanging the hypothesis and the conclusion, we deny both the hypothesis and the conclusion. So now we have two statements that are, if I sleep, then I breathe, and if I do not breathe, then I do not sleep. So we have interchanged the hypothesis and the conclusion and denied them both. If you're still not following, I'm going to provide diagrams on my website that can help explain this a little bit further and also help explain what I'm about to tell you. Because, believe it or not, because a statement and its contrapositive are represented by the same diagram, the statements are logically equivalent. What this means is that... Unlike a converse statement, where one statement can be true and the other can be false, in the contrapositive statement, one statement can't be true and the other statement can't be false. They are either both true or they are either both false. So on my website, I show that both statements are represented by the same diagram and how they are logically equivalent. Finally, Let's talk about inverse. The inverse of a conditional statement is when we deny both the hypothesis and the conclusion. So let's take the converse of the original argument where the dormouse says, if I breathe, then I sleep. Okay, that's the converse. And then we're going to invert the statement and deny both the hypothesis and the conclusion. We then get the two statements, if I breathe, then I sleep, and if I do not sleep, then I do not breathe. Believe it or not, these two statements are also logically equivalent. This means that in both statements, both are either true or false. So, to recap, we have the initial conditional statement, which in math terms would be if A, then B. We then have the converse of the statement, which is if B, then A. Then we have the contrapositive of the statement, which is if not B, then not A. And finally, the inverse of the statement, which is, if not A, then not B. The conditional statement and the contrapositive of the statement are logically equivalent, and the converse of the statement and the inverse of the statement are logically equivalent. Believe it or not, you took all of this in when you first read Alice in Wonderland. You may not have understood it, but Charles Lutwidge Dodson presented it to you. So, if you think about it, you were learning about logic and reasoning as a young kid and you didn't even know it. So again, for all of you who think you aren't math people, think again. Between the words that fill some of our greatest literature, we have some of the greatest forms of math. Logic, deductive reasoning, and critical thinking are our greatest tools for sifting through information, false statements, and conspiracies that we are faced with on a daily basis. Critical thinking is our greatest weapon in our current society. Lewis Carroll did that. Bertrand Russell did that. Sofia Kovalevskaya did that. Arthur C. Clarke did that. Isaac Asimov did that. And J. Golden Lane did that. If you are interested in seeing how these statements work on my website, I post Euler diagrams that help explain converse, contrapositive, and inverse statements. Please come visit me. And while you're there, if you like what you're listening to, please click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee because every cup of coffee helps to pay for the production of this podcast. Thank you for listening to Math Science History. Until next week, carpe diem.